Hello. So I know I'm the thing standing between you and lunch, so I'll try to make this interesting. So um, hi, my name is uh, Krithik Ramesh, and um, as was previously mentioned, I was the winner of the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair this year. So essentially, my research for this year was developing intelligent navigational aids for spinal reconstruction surgery that uses augmented reality. So um, there is a lot of um, forefront in this field, as previously mentioned, with um, other navigational systems that are trying to eliminate fluoroscopy or replace it, and also intelligent navigation systems. So that's currently where I lie. Next slide. Is there? Is it that one? Yep. Okay. Oops. Okay, so just a quick introduction of like general timeline is that I'll be going a little bit of background and then the engineering goals for my general project, as well as development and design of the actual algorithm for the process and then looking at viability and testing, and then finally future steps and practical applications. So um, existing systems of fluoro um, navigation, realistically the one they'll be focusing on is fluoroscopy, is that they pose some sort of physiological repercussions and other disadvantages that make them not particularly useful at this point, um, such as physiological repercussions from radiation emissions, as well as limited visual acuity from just a two-dimensional perspective or latency in three-dimensional perspectives. Um, and there's also, like, it's a relatively expensive system that makes it difficult for developing regions or rural regions that have um, patients that need help. Um, moving forward onto engineering goals is, um, primarily had three engineering goals, and the first one was to actually develop the machine learning lab, uh, navigational system that can do, um, guide the surgeon in real time. And then moving forward, also implementing a computer vision system and augmented reality. So this is done through the use of Microsoft HoloLens and then try to use that as like the viable headset for navigation itself. And then real world viability and testing, and I'll go over um, the limitations of my research in that regard. Um, so generally speaking, the development process was rather steep as far as learning goes, learning um, bio, biomechanics and also spine anatomy and um, a general amount of a lot of computational work for machine learning. And then moving forward to actually analyze data sets and try to optimize the algorithms that were being developed to better cater to those circumstances. Um, apart from development and real world testing, there's also AR development, which is uh, slightly more difficult working with um, complex computer vision. And then finally, theoretical testing. So the data set itself. So the data set uh, comes from a variety of different institutions, specifically from Stanford University's Radiology Clinic of Imaging, as well as the University of Hawaii at Manoa and Oxford University. So collectively, these had a comprehensive data set of roughly 2,000 MRI and CT scans, which is what I used to develop spine biomechanics and also train my data set. So, um, there's a variety of different patient characteristics that we're taking care of versus like gender, age, conditions, height, weight, um, and all of these played into creating a more comprehensive model. So while 2000 MRI and CT scan seems pretty large, in the case of machine learning, it's actually utilization of small data. Um, so data augmentation processes were required for this, and um, the data was split 40% for testing and 60% for validation in machine learning terms. That's um, pretty unorthodox because I gain more from validation in cases from medical cases more so than from training MRI and CT scans. Um, so accounting for variations in the data set was one of the bigger problems. So specifically looking at different machines, so using different MRI or CT machines had different radiology outputs from like thresholds and trying to re-standardize those as well as patient morphology varies quite significantly from like height and weight. So also accounting for those differences. So um, essentially what you can see here, is, um, see here is as close to Gaussian distribution as I could get for a variety of different independent factors. So by doing data augmentation and optimization, you can get closer to a perfect distribution. So the data set geographic distribution was from the United States, a couple of countries from the European Union, the UK, um, some countries in Africa and India. So the data set covered a variety of different epigenetic and congenital factors that could have affected overall performance. 
And then, so this is the actual data set optimization methodology. And specifically what this goes over is something called principal component analysis, which is a linearized version of data compression that's done. So by doing so, essentially what I'm able to do is take an entire spine and then decompress it into a two-dimensional plane by finding the sub-features and then extracting them. So essentially what this allowed for was data compression by approximately 72% because the anatomical bodies are relatively similar. And then um, training time reduction was uh, done quite extensively, so GPU training took a lot less time. And then it also increased overall computational efficiency for the AR headset. Um, so to prevent data degradation, which consistently happens with machine learning and training in general, was done through something called shortcut connection layers. And essentially, if the confidence interval for identification of a vertebral body was high enough, that it would skip, to, uh, skip through certain layers of the actual identification process to optimize overall time computing, as well as data efficiency. So the algorithms themselves, and this is like the nuts and bolts of how my navigation system or navigational aid works. So the mathematical modeling behind it is essentially um, a couple of adjustable biases and weights. And realistically, what this does is the first two weights are used for the different like actual training. And then the second two summations are for adjustable biases from different forms of modalities. And then the second algorithm is actually the template matching, which allows for me to build a three-dimensional spline curvature model for the 2000 MRI and CT scans to predict spine biomechanics. And then um, the final algorithm is actually how I can iteratively update each of the vertebral bodies and positioning so that based off of cervical screw placement, as you're putting in the screws, you can predict what the motion of each individual vertebral body will look like. So this is the actual hierarchical deformable model, and this is the algorithm used for predicting global and local ge geometric functions of a spine. So the way that it's done is that in the initial trading phase of the algorithm, you combine CT and MRI scan feature data to create a more comprehensive outlook. And then based off of that, and something called a restricted uh, Boltzmann machine, uh, you develop a machine learning algorithm that can segment and actually identify vertebral bodies and um, their individual features. So once that's done on a two-dimensional plane, it's reconstructed. So um, once this process is done for vertebral detection, we move on to center points for global reconstruction. So this allows for the global points of individual spine characteristics or important points in the spine curvature to be analyzed. Um, so after the segmentation is done, we move on to global shape registration and pose estimation. So this allows for individual vertebral bodies to be identified for their exact positioning. So during surgery, this would be helpful as far as actually identifying the exact margins. And then um, this is what the internal architecture for the actual identification system for the vertebral bodies looks like. Um, and then, so this is a network graph of a hierarchical deformable model. And essentially what this allows is to create like a priority sequence for what would be affected for um, a given calculation of a screw placement. So in this region, you can see um, cervical nodes of connection. So these are points that were determined by the algorithm as statistically significant for surgical outcomes. So in case that there was a structural integrity failure or something that would have gone wrong, these are the systems that would be affected. And then um, it allows for anatomical landmarking to see certain vertebral body features or just anatomical points to allow for navigation. And then this is the region-based convolutional neural network, which actually estimates what the region of like where the screws would be placed. So the way that this works is that it looks for a region of probability for each of the given vertebrae, and then based off of that, creates the outline for each um, vertebral body and the disk space in between. So the segmentation and classification is done through something called a convolutional neural network. And then based off of the segmentation system, you're allowed to find um, each of the fine tuning probabilities, and then finally an outlook on what are viable anchor points for each of the vertebrae. So this is done in 3D, but for the time being, this is the only view that I have. And then the actual part which uses the augmented reality headset is called simultaneous localization and mapping. So this is a common, commonly used in robotics for um, the DARPA challenge, and essentially it's trying to map and organize 
uh, a room with a priori experience, uh, with priori, no priori experience. So essentially what this means is that based off of a given set of circumstances, it can stitch a series of images together in 3D and then determine what it is looking at. So the general way that this is done is that it takes the um, infrared sensors and then does a three-dimensional reconstruction of whatever the surgeon is looking at. And then based off of that, re-references the CT or MRI scan that was taken preoperatively to identify what part of the body they're working on. So the reconstruction of the environment, and then it cross-validates whatever was done with the hierarchical deformable model. Um, this is the most computationally efficient, um, expensive of all the models at O of n cubed runtime. And realistically, what this means is that while the latency is relatively high, but it still works better than certain systems that are available in the market right now. And then for the sake of being extra clear with actual blood vessel mapping and networks, I use diffusion tensor imaging and tractography to actually map the spinal cord to ensure that there weren't any vertebral or lateral beaches, or if the screws were being placed, that there wouldn't be any adverse outcomes. And then the actual results. So um, the support vector machine, which is the thing used to classify all the vertebrae, had a very high accuracy rating of about 99.7%. And it's also the most computationally efficient of all the algorithms used um, because it runs in constant time. Um, because each of these represents one region. So um, cervical, because cervical, Lum uh, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. And the longevity is relatively based off of how deviant the structural bodies look from one another. So the closer they are in anatomical features, the smaller the circle gets for that given region. Um, so since given its high accuracy and overall performance, it seemed like a good way of classifying vertebral bodies. And then this is the actual region-based convolutional neural network um, receiver operator characteristics. And essentially what this allows for is the act to indicate the performance of that algorithm identifying the segments and margins of each vertebral body. So the way that this works is that the area under the curve is trying to be optimized. So it ranges between 0 0.73 to 0 0.91. For it to be considered a viable algorithm in computing industries, we would usually use the 0 0.65 threshold. So all of these algorithms work relatively well. Convergence versus convergence recall versus precision is the general algorithm used for seeing how well the data set was actually curated. So if there's convergence to be seen in the actual data set, it's generally indicative of good performance overall. And since the three classification systems converged relatively closely, um, it's indicative of good performance. And then the logistic regression is the closest I got to actual real world validation. So I took 34 um, data, publicly available data sets of surgeries being done with their MRI scans and then validated what their scans would look like based off of my algorithm versus the actual computed algorithm. So the regression line was about 0 0.89, which is relatively close to what would be expected. Um, with further improvement in actual hardware settings and also software implementation, this number could be higher. And then this is the actual comparative results of other deep learning models that have been used to actually identify um, vertebral bodies and suggest surgical approaches. So their average error was anywhere between 9.9 .9 and 12.4 millimeters in precision error. And then their labeling accuracies were lower as well. So um, my proposed system has the ability to have increased accuracy at about roughly 98.6% compared to the 86% average from other machine learning models and then also increased precision and relatively decreased um, detection time. So um, from a practical viability standpoint, there's an estimated reduction in operating time by 16% if you're um, with integrated navigation systems. So um, this is further, more, more so on the end of the spectrum of using augmented reality, more so than my device specifically. But it's also um, cheaper for fluoroscopy than about roughly 96% because the HoloLens headset is about $4,000. And then reduction in recovery time is expected at 8% based off of um, screw placement and local geometry strain. Thank you. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? I thought you'd have a question. Uh, I don't, yeah. I, I need some translation. <laughs> Yeah. Down for, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I some of the stuff I use is pretty technical. Um, 
from the computer science perspective. So essentially what I've done is developed an algorithm that can predict spine biomechanics from the most uh, recent preoperative MRI or CT scan. And then based off of that, I can use the Microsoft HoloLens as a navigational aid for spinal reconstruction surgery for pedicle screw placement. So essentially, um, the last uh, speaker's uh, uh, augmented yeah. reality, but trying to be more In accurate or... Yeah, trying to be more accurate, but also serve as a better guide for finding the exact margins for where to place the screw. Um, it's a little bit difficult with augmented reality in general because it relies on the computer systems on the headset itself. So um, current systems are, you're obviously, as previously mentioned, or you're looking away. So by using the HoloLens, it's integrated into the view line of sight. Um, and by using machine learning, it would optimize the certain uh, system for better. Do you have anything working model or anything? I do have a HoloLens in the back, and I can show that later. But I couldn't get the screencasting to work, so. Um, yeah, I can show you what an overlay of that would look like. So it creates the spine in 3D um, through reconstruction and then overlays it onto the patient's actual spine with the accurate dimensions and then also shows the lines for where to place the screws. There was something in your algorithm about um, dynamic tracking or anything. Yeah. So if the spine were to be, a lot of us just talk about not touching the spine, not moving it. Um, I got a sense that somehow if your, your algorithm able to track that real time. Yeah, so it uses a series of partial derivatives and force functions. So essentially, I can predict, I develop a mathematical model using machine learning to predict what the cervical um, spines would move like or their general behavior would be with screw placement happening. Mm -hmm. So um, like a cadaver would probably be required for more active testing, but from whatever testing viability metrics that I had, Another question. Yeah, got a question. Um, so you would use the HoloLens and it would be linked into your own system that you're building? Everything was done natively through the HoloLens. So but I, the HoloLens is not a navigation system, so I'm just trying to right. sort out what you're using for the navigation. Right, so that would be done through the variety of different algorithms that were previously presented. So the region-based convolutional neural network takes a look at the images from the real world and then also the MRI scans. So the three of those algorithms from cross-validation of the first hierarchical deformable model with the region probability of the, each of the vertebrates from the region-based convolutional neural network. And then the actual simultaneous localization and mapping is done using the augmented reality headset. And then that cross-references with the theoretical data from the actual radiology. So it takes the real world data from the HoloLens. So there's no camera? It uses it, three cameras. So it uses the infrared um, and depth perception cameras on the HoloLens, and then takes the reconstructed 3D images from the real world to see where those regions were, and then cross-validate with whatever was presented in the reading reports. OK. I can, I can show you the actual headset. I, I, I think some people want to see the headset at yeah. some point. All right, well, thank you very much. That was awesome.